perhaps one of the most watched global event recently was a rather unbelievable armed rebellion in Russia. Hi, trust you're all doing well. So debris from a mutiny that gripped the world for a little over 24 hours has neither settled in Russia nor in the minds of Russia watchers. Even though a compromise was reached by alleged mediation from Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko, Kremlin's closest brush with Stunde Null, a German term for zero hour that was used in the immediate aftermath of World War II, which signified a complete break from the past. So coming back, Kremlin's first closest brush with its Stunde Null moment ever since the Soviet Union collapsed has triggered more questions than the ones the compromise sought to settle. But there is an undeniable sense of deja vu. The latest spat between Russian private military company, the PMC Wagner, and the Ministry of Defense, the MOD, has transported public memory back to the winter of 2014. It was the year when Russia took away the region of Crimea from Ukraine. Radio Free Europe published a video on how, in chilling winters, insignia-less men in green uniforms emerged in Crimea. In no time did they raise the Russian flag over the Crimean parliament and days later captured the Simferopol airport. The little green men masqueraded as the real liberators even when the Russian army had military bases in Crimea under a 1997 treaty with Ukraine. Despite an impressive array of military victories in 2014, Russia's ruling elite denied any links with them and the Russian army. However, a year later, the special forces, that is the men in green, were praised by President Putin when he publicly accepted having ordered the army to deploy them. So what's with this deny first, endorse later paradox? The persona of these little green masqueraders and among them, the Wagner mercenaries especially, dappled in notorious mystique as their influence, activity and fortunes, especially that of their leader, the former convict and Putin loyalist Yevgeny Prigozhin's, kept rising under Russian special operations in war-torn Africa and Syria. So the denial first endorsement later paradox has continued. Retracting his 2022 position of denial just days after the armed mutiny, Putin publicly accepted MOD providing for the maintenance of Wagner and rolled out details of money spent on them, quite like what he did in 2015. Over the last decade, PMC Wagner has kept operating within the grey zone as a shadow instrument of state policy, giving the Russian army a perfect alibi to invoke deniability with anything it doesn't wish to get identified with. You know, I've already written a piece on Wagner and their functions within Russia and abroad. Clearly, the proliferation of officially sanctioned but illegally existing military groups has more to do with the dynamics of Russian domestic politics than the conduct of war itself. This unnerving facet of a modern state stems from the absence of independent institutions as guarantors of rule of law and state legitimacy. So in Russia, the quest for an equilibrium of convergence among competing power centers, the president, ministry of defense, secret services, Russian intelligence, special forces, private military companies and powerful oligarchs, and the different permutations of jealousy, rivalry, etc. among them, have landed Russia where it is today. Ostensibly, most of these private armies have been established on specific instructions from the Kremlin. And actually, several precedents exist for it. During Russia's feudal era, the Tsar's vassals were obliged to assemble and equip armies for the empire's wars of conquest. Bewildering analogies can be drawn between those Middle Ages and 21st century Russia. Incidentally, Redoubt, the private army of Gennady Timchenko, Putin's alleged financier and founder of the Swiss-based oil trading Gunver Group, has been accused of serious war crimes in Ukraine. Going further, even the defense minister, Sergei Shoigu himself, is said to have a private army called Patriot. And the list actually goes on. But the story with Wagner has taken a completely different layer of complexity. 
I'll tell you how. Instead of emerging in complementarity to the MOT as uh, faithful assistants and keepers of the state narrative, Wagner's international successes, especially, of course, in Syria and Africa, and rising influence with Putin and the Russian Federal Security Service, the FSB, have pitched it against the country's MOT. Especially the Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and the Chief of the General Staff, Valery Gerasimov. Details of their ugly public spat are well recorded through Wagner's and Prigozhin's telegram handles, which quite became the mouthpiece of these clashes. Wagner's military successes at the battlefront, especially Bakhmut, have also garnered support from a group of oligarchs who, understandably wary of financial losses from thousands of coordinated sanctions imposed by the West, wish for the pointless war to end. So, as you know, PMC Wagner credits itself with delivering Russia's face saver victory in Ukraine's Bakhmut in May this year. But 10 months into that meat grinder have manifested MOD and Wagner's internal chasms that went unchecked by Putin for a year and have ultimately led to this armed rebellion. The center of gravity of Prigozhin's mutiny was a less known but important town called Rostov Unton. Now, this town is important because it is the headquarters of the Southern Military Command of the Russian Army and its command and control center for the Ukraine war as well. So, all the planning for the war in Ukraine happens in Rostov Unton. So, how did this point of no return arrive? In a major embarrassment for the Russian army, the inhabitants of Rostov Unton actually fed and cheered for Wagner troops as its tanks rolled down the city. What was even more intriguing was how General Yunus Bek Yevkorov, Russia's Deputy Minister of Defense and General Vladimir Alexeyev, Deputy Military Intelligence Chief, sat dispirited near Prigozhin with no attempt to fight or even argue back as he went on disparaging the military's inept leadership in Ukraine. Some obvious questions come to mind. What makes Prigozhin so defiant and so fearless? And what could it mean for Russia's future? That's if he survives. So, Prigozhin actually enjoys support from at least three actors within Russia. A section within the FSB, the secret services, a section of oligarchs who are unhappy with the war, and a segment of public that sees him as a hero. So, when the first column of Wagner forces led by Prigozhin marched into Rostov Unton, an emergency plan to guard the city called the Fortress Plan, put together by Russian Secret Service or the FSB, it fell without any opposition despite the presence of the Rostov police and two special units, Special Purpose Mobile Unit and Special Unit of Quick Response. Rostov police did not detain, penalize or even press charges against anyone for an unsanctioned armed rebellion that trampled the streets and the egos of the world's second largest military. Even as Putin finally gave a recorded speech of his country's enemies committing treason against Mother Russia, not even a single official stood up to Wagner columns in Rostov and not a single oligarch expressed anger at a private military company punching above its weight. This was the story of the first Wagner column led by Prigozhin. But there was a second Wagner column as well. Taking key highway M4 via the city of Voronoze, the second Wagner column en route to Moscow inflicted casualties and damage to the Russian army. According to several reports, half a dozen army helicopters and one army plane along with the pilot were shot down during Wagner's march to the capital. Moscow's mayor, in fact, declared Monday a public holiday in anticipation of more aerial losses and damage to the army from Wagner attacks. So how did Prigozhin commit the unthinkable? Much as obscures, uh, so not enough can be laid threadbare. But again, not much is discussed on the factor of Wagner 
and the FSB, the secret services, in the ensuing debates on this unthinkable armed rebellion within Russia. Reportedly, Prigozhin and FSB aimed to change the MOD duo, Shoigo and Gerasimov, with its supported generals, perhaps even as some reports suggest, planning to oust Putin. Although all have condemned the obstinacy, obduracy and suicidal audacity shown by Prigozhin, FSB has had a role to allow Prigozhin reach this level of prominence. So, in my opinion, the ponderable here isn't the quick phone call compromise reached between Prigozhin and Putin. It is Putin's peaking non-response to months of escalating tensions between his chef Prigozhin and the MOT and the apparent paralysis to crack down on the mutineers once the armed rebellion began. And just as strategic analysts all over the world racked their brains over why an all-powerful and invincible Putin wouldn't crack down on a mere private military company, he further acknowledged the dysfunction of the Russian state apparatus, confessing that his quick compromise, you know, on the phone call, averted a civil war in Russia. What could be more ironic than the president himself conceding to such choppy waters? However, in a hurry to show business as usual, the case of the first armed mutiny in 23 years of Putin's rule has been closed. Prigozhin is lying low for the time being. Something is definitely amiss. So, Wagner may now have to change its registration to Belarus, thus becoming a Belarusian PMC, allowing it the space to keep defying the Russian MOT. But perhaps the most notable victory lies in Putin providing amnesty to the Wagner troops involved in the mutiny, with neither a single police case nor any other penalty against them. In fact, they have been given the option of joining the Russian army. And no one knows how that will pan out. These Wagner troops are hardened criminals inducted from Russia's prisons. How will they function within a formal army apparatus? They are all simply getting away scot-free. In fact, claims of the only arrest made so far have been that of missing decorated MOD General Sergei Sorovikin, who is also the deputy commander for the Russian army in Ukraine. Sorovikin allegedly knew about Prigozhin's plans and supported him by not reporting them to the MOD. Sorovokin, by the way, is also supported within the FSP and happens to be one of the contenders, lest Shoigu or Gerasimov are replaced later. Now, let's go through the bit on global reactions and silences on the situation. Apart from obvious notes to self of never backing mercenary groups, unraveling the real thinking in the Communist Party of China and Xi Jinping's inner circle remains speculative. Media depictions lack authenticity as the Chinese media remains tightly controlled. However, it was interesting to note that in a tweet that was later deleted, Hu Shijin, former editor of Global Times, said that Russia can't return to the country that it was after Prigozhin's armed rebellions. Chinese scholars too have expressed disdain at the situation in Russia despite the state's official optics of supporting Moscow in this hour of crisis. But the most important impact uh, to be discussed should be on the Ukrainian counteroffensive. The preposterous display of disarray within Russia's power agencies has weakened the infallible and invincible image of the Russian state and its military. Immediately after the mutiny, UK intelligence confirmed that Ukrainians for the first time have regained territory that was lost in 2014. Now, even when modest, this is a major morale boost for the Ukrainians and everything opposite for the Russian soldiers that to date grapple with exactly what they are fighting and dying for. In a latest move, the US has imposed sanctions on four companies in the UAE, Central African Republic and Russia, accusing them of financing Wagner's operations through illicit gold and diamond trade. Finally, one cardinal issue merits more attention in public discussion. Preparing for any likelihood of an impending breakdown of an increasingly fragile political status quo in Russia remains uncharted and uncomfortable territory.
From Intel's perspective, the latest exchange between National Security Advisor Ajit Doval and FSB General Nikolai Patrushev may not do much damage control for Russia's MOD, considering FSB's disapproval of the latter. Therefore, the idea of a massive state armed with the world's largest arsenal of tactical as well as conventional nuclear weapons and unending reservoirs of hydrocarbons falling victim to its internal dysfunctions is a perplexing thought. Its ramifications would spill beyond the current war in Ukraine. Perhaps the best way out for Russia is to put the war efforts on the back burner, despite all the risen stakes I understand, and tend to its dangerous internal divisions before they trigger another brush with the Stundinal. The link to my article is given in the description box for those of you interested in further references. I will be back to track these developments, among others, that pose a threat to not just European but global geopolitics and geoeconomics. Stay tuned.